My name is Dr. Noreen Johnson. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist with 44 years of experience and I've completed over 1,000 abortions. Today, I'm going to explain how the abortion pill works, which has been approved by the FDA to be taken up to the 10th week of pregnancy, although many abortion facilities use the pill off-label for weeks after that. The abortion pill regimen consists of two steps. Step one. At the abortion facility or at home, the woman swallows mefepristone pills. Mefepristone blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When mefepristone blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off oxygen and vital nutrients to the embryo, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to stop the effects of the mefepristone and save the embryo if progesterone is administered. If the woman wants to stop the effects of the mefepristone, she needs progesterone as soon as possible. Step two, 24 to 48 hours after taking mefepristone, the woman takes misoprostol by placing the pills in her cheeks. She will experience severe cramping, contractions, and heavy bleeding to force the dead embryo out of her uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her embryo anytime and anywhere during the process, the woman will often sit on the toilet as she prepares to expel the embryo, which she will then flush. She may even see the expelled embryo within the pregnancy sac. After she has disposed of the embryo, the woman may have bleeding and spotting for several weeks. Bleeding lasts on average 9 to 16 days. 8% of women bleed more than 30 days and half a percent require hospitalization because of heavy bleeding. The failure rate increases as the pregnancy progresses. At 8 weeks or less, the failure rate is 2 to 6%. At eight or nine weeks, the failure rate is four to six percent. At nine to ten weeks, the failure rate is seven to nine percent. At ten to eleven weeks, the failure rate is thirteen percent. If failure occurs, she will usually be offered a surgical abortion in which the embryo or remaining tissue is removed using suction. For the mother, abortion pills often cause abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and heavy bleeding. Maternal deaths have occurred, most frequently due to infection and undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is when implantation occurs outside the uterus, usually in the fallopian tube. My name is Dr. Beverly McMillan. I'm a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist with 45 years of experience, and I've completed around 500 abortions. Today, I'm going to explain a first trimester suction DNC abortion, also called vacuum aspiration abortion. This is typically used up to 14 weeks of pregnancy. When the woman goes to the facility for the abortion, she will lie on a table with her feet in stirrups, and she will be administered local anesthesia. The abortionist will place a speculum like this inside the vagina and open it, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix is grasped with a long metal instrument to stabilize it. A series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness, are inserted into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the fetus resides. The abortionist then inserts into the uterus a hollow plastic tube with a hole in it called a cannula and attaches it to suction. If the embryo is small enough, the cannula can be attached to a syringe, and manual suction alone will remove the embryo and placenta from the uterus. Otherwise, the cannula will be attached to a suction machine. The suction machine is turned on and the abortionist slowly rotates the cannula inside the uterus. The fetus is rapidly torn to pieces as it is pulled through the cannula and tubing into a large glass bottle, followed by the placenta. Sometimes smaller embryos are pulled through intact. Occasionally, the abortionist must remove the cannula 
and pull out body parts that have clogged the opening to complete the abortion. Once the abortionist thinks everything has been removed, she will sometimes use a long metal curette to scrape the lining of the uterus to make sure no parts are left behind. An incomplete abortion can cause infection or bleeding. Once the uterus is empty and the bleeding is under control and all the instruments are removed, the abortion is considered complete. But before the patient leaves, the tissue must be examined to make sure the placenta and all the body parts are accounted for. Two arms, two legs, a spine, a skull. The risks of suction abortion include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels. Other risks include hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. My name is Dr. Kathy Altman. I'm a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist with almost 33 years of experience, and I've completed over 500 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilation and evacuation, or d and &E. A d and &E is generally performed between 14 and 22 weeks of pregnancy. Before a D&E abortion can be done, the cervix must be dilated slowly over one to two days with laminaria or a similar product. Laminaria is a type of seaweed that absorbs water and swells to several times its original diameter. When the woman undergoes the evacuation portion of the procedure, she lies on a table with her legs in stirrups. She may be given injections of local anesthetic in the cervix, IV conscious sedation, or general anesthesia. The abortionist uses a speculum to open the vagina and uses an instrument to stabilize the cervix. Metal dilators may be used to further open the cervix if needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, a cannula attached to suction tubing is placed inside the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on and the amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus is suctioned out. The fetus is too large to fit through the cannula, so he or she must be removed in pieces with a clamp such as this sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel and is about 13 inches long. At the tip, there are rows of teeth for grasping. The abortionist reaches into the uterus with the clamp and tries to grasp an arm or leg. Once the abortionist has a firm grip, she pulls forcefully in order to remove the limb. Piece by piece, the abortionist removes the arms and legs, followed by the head or the body, including the torso and pelvis, along with the intestines, the heart, and the lungs. The placenta is also removed. If the cervix has been overdilated, the body or even the entire fetus may be pulled out intact. Usually, the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the fetus's head, which at 20 weeks is about the size of a large plum. The abortionist must open the clamp widely to grasp the head and then crush it so that it will fit through the cervix. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance, the fetus's brains, leaks out through the cervix. The abortionist then removes the compressed head. Any remaining limbs, organs, bone fragments, or pieces of placenta not removed with the forceps are removed by scraping the uterine lining with a large curette or by reinserting the suction cannula. The abortionist then reassembles the fetal parts to make sure that there is nothing left inside the uterus which could cause infection or bleeding. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the bleeding has been controlled, and all the instruments have been removed from the vagina, the abortion is considered complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, with possible damage to bowel, bladder, or other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at an increased risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related physical trauma and injury to the cervix. My name is Dr. Patty Giebink. I've been a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist for over 25 years, and I've completed thousands of abortions. Today, I'm going to describe induction abortions, generally done from 22 weeks to term at 39 weeks. Because the child is so large and developed, an abortion procedure at this point takes two to three days to complete. And due to the risks and the need for monitoring, this procedure is generally done in the hospital or a surgery center. 
On day one, mifepristone is given orally. Mifepristone blocks the pregnancy hormone progesterone, causing the lining of the uterus to degenerate, starving the fetus of vital nutrients and oxygen. Mifepristone alone doesn't necessarily kill the fetus, so fetal demise is often induced beforehand. This is often only done for babies 20 weeks or older. A syringe with a large needle is filled with a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is used to treat heart problems, but an overdose of digoxin will cause fetal cardiac arrest. A long needle is inserted through the woman's abdomen or vagina, and the digoxin is injected into the fluid surrounding the fetus under ultrasound guidance. The fetus doesn't die immediately, which is why this is normally done one or two days beforehand. For the drug to be more effective, the abortion doctor can also inject the digoxin directly into the fetus, targeting either the body, heart, or umbilical vein. Potassium chloride can also be used to induce fetal demise more immediately. The fetus usually dies within 24 hours of the injection of digoxin. If the fetus doesn't die within 24 hours, the injection can be repeated. Death is normally confirmed by ultrasound before the start of delivery. On day two, 24 to 36 hours after the mifepristone, the woman is given misoprostol either orally or vaginally, causing her to go into labor. The misoprostol dose can be repeated every three hours up to five times. Usually, after 24 hours of starting the misoprostol, the woman will vaginally deliver the fetus. If the woman is having trouble delivering, she may be given a synthetic hormone called Pitocin to promote labor. Once the fetus and the placenta have been delivered and the bleeding is under control, the abortion is complete. Complication rates increase as the fetus grows. The major complication from induced abortion is incomplete abortion in which pieces of the fetus and placenta are left behind. This requires surgical intervention. Other complications include cervical laceration, infection, hemorrhage, uterine rupture, and even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma, including injury to the cervix. The purpose of an elective abortion is to ensure the delivery of a dead fetus. On the other hand, if a baby is wanted and the mother's health is in danger, the obstetrician induces labor or does a C-section and will have a neonatal specialist present to take care of the baby. As I mentioned in the beginning, I used to perform abortions. In fact, I helped to open the first abortion clinic in the state of Mississippi in 1975. At the time, I truly believed I was helping women. Over time, however, I realized that abortion doesn't just end a pregnancy, it ends the life of an innocent, unique human being. I initially stopped doing abortions to save my reputation. I was becoming known as a town abortionist, and I didn't want that. Later, however, I came to recognize the inherent value and dignity of all human life. That's when I truly saw the ugliness of abortion. One day, I looked at the remains of a 12-week-old baby boy that I had just aborted, and I thought to myself, what is the difference between this little boy and my own four-year-old son? After the birth of my daughter, however, I realized that abortion doesn't just end a pregnancy. It kills an innocent human being. Such terms as zygote, embryo, or fetus are simply terms that refer to age, like infant, toddler, and adult, and do nothing to diminish the humanity of the child. As I cared for women in my OBGYN practice, I also learned how abortion harms women. No, I am a pro-life advocate. Now, I am a pro-life advocate. I am now a pro-life advocate. I stopped doing abortions and I became a pro-life advocate. I am proof that anyone can change, no matter who they are or what they have done. Thank you for watching.